and welcome to Field Lab Earth, the podcast that's all about past and present advances in the fields of agronomic, crop, soil, and environmental sciences. Today, we're doing our half of a podcast swap with Brendan Black of the Talk Ag to Me podcast. We're going to talk all things ag literacy, but first, a couple of quick thank yous to our sponsors, starting with Meter Group. Meter specializes in robust soil moisture sensing, innovative weather monitoring, cloud data logging, advanced data visualization software, and more. Their well-published scientific instrumentation is used worldwide in universities, research and testing labs, government agencies, agriculture, and industrial applications. Find world-class webinars about the science behind environmental measurements at metergroup.com slash fieldlabearth. Next up, we have Gazmat Technologies, the maker of the GT5000 Terra, the smallest portable FTIR multi-gas analyzer for greenhouse gas and environmental research. Measure carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, methane, nitrous oxide, nitric oxide, nitrogen dioxide, ammonia, and water vapor in real time simultaneously from static or automated chambers. Visit www.gazmet.com, that's gazmet spelled G-A-S-M-E-T, or email sales at gazmet.com for more information. Thank you for being our sponsors. I'm your host, Abby Morrison. Let's talk about science. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. Today, we have Brendan Black with us. Brendan is the host of the Talk Ag to Me podcast, a podcast focused on ag literacy. He is a student at Fresno State University studying to be a high school agriculture teacher. Hi, Brendan. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? Very good. Thanks for having me. Great to have you with us. So uh, as the intro might suggest, today we are going to be talking about ag literacy. So to get us started, can you just give us a high-level overview of what ag literacy means? Yeah. Uh, So the uh, National Agriculture in the Classroom basically defines agricultural literacy as uh, someone who has a basic understanding of the food and fiber system. Uh, they'd be able to analyze, synthesize, communicate basic information about uh, where their food comes from, how different processes work in the agriculture industry, and and that general concept. So that's kind of the you know, that's the basic definition. But you know, in layman terms, basically, somebody knows where you know that their food doesn't just come from a grocery store. They understand that it goes through a whole process to get from farm to their plate. Great. And part of the reason we wanted to have you on the show is uh, you come from a little bit of a different background from most of the. Uh, kind of more research focused guests that we have. And so you told me a little bit about your your personal journey in agriculture. So can you tell us about kind of your story in ag? What drew you into agriculture? And then what keeps you in agriculture? Yeah, of course. So I grew up in a uh, small town in Central California. Uh, the town's called Tulare. Uh, for anyone who's ever heard of the World Ag Expo, that is uh, where it's where it's hosted. Um, and we call it Cowtown back home because it's surrounded by dairies. So I've been pretty much uh, around agriculture my whole life. Uh, from a young age, I've been around dairies, around corn, uh, you know, trees. Because um, t- uh, Tulare is a, a common uh, growing uh, paradise really for for almonds and pistachios and walnuts and other tree nuts as well as dairies and and other types of row crops um so a really agriculture has been involved in my life for for pretty much you know since i since i was born uh but it wasn't something that i really took an interest in until i got into high school um growing up i obviously like i mentioned had been around agriculture but i was more interested in uh, technology and science and animals and i was you know a bit of a bit of a science nerd you know which i uh, still kind of am um but i had really gotten involved in agriculture after i had graduated from middle school and my parents basically made me try a year of ffa and so uh, I tried a year, you know, I got involved in FFA, I got involved in some some speaking teams, some judging teams, I showed uh, beef cattle for a few years. And I just from then on, I just really got sucked in because I was doing a speaking team called extemporaneous. Uh, basically, for anyone who doesn't know, extemporaneous is a contest where you go into like in, in the contest setting, you go into a room, and you have 30 minutes, you pick a topic and you have, you know, those 30 minutes to take um, any resources you have with you that you have done your own research and write a th- uh, four to six minute speech on it. And then you have to go present that speech. And then you have five minutes of questions you have to answer from the judges as well. So 
as one could imagine, I had to do a significant amount of research to be prepared for those contests. And that kind of is what introduced me to the idea of the ag issues that I was talking about. And as I was doing more and more speaking, I realized that there was kind of a common thread across all these issues. And that was that a big contender to why these issues are as bad as they are is because the people who are consuming the products that we're producing through agriculture aren't aware of how those products are being produced. And so that's leading to them causing, um, you know, voting decisions and purchasing decisions and just general uh, lack of communication that negatively impacts farmers. And so that was kind of what, you know, called me to action to, to want to get involved in agriculture and, and stay involved in, in, the, in the literacy portion of it. And it's actually what inspired me to become a high school agriculture teacher, which, you know, as, as Abby mentioned, is what I'm studying to, to become. Um, but that was kind of the, you know, my story leading up to it. And then my senior year of high school, I was competing on the state level in that speaking team. And I was just getting so overwhelmed with information that I had re- I was researching I needed some way to get rid of it and so I developed the podcast as a I mean we can you know discuss this in depth more later but I developed it as a form of venting out some of that information and so that just kind of was like the, the starting seed that developed my my career in agricultural literacy and and teaching people about where their food comes from great that is uh such a such a fun journey you've been on, I'm sure, uh, diving into all these things. Two two things I want to highlight off of that. Um, first, so I am aware of FFA, but I have never been like closely uh, involved in it myself. So for people who aren't familiar with FFA, can you kind of give an overview of like what it is and what they do um, or like some activities they're involved in? Yeah, definitely. So for anyone who doesn't know, FFA, um, well, it used to stand for the Future Farmers of America. And recently, in in about 1988, they changed the name for logistics reasons, but that's beside the point. For For all intents and purposes, it stands for Future Farmers of America. And essentially, it's a youth leadership organization that is rooted in agriculture. Um, so we learn leadership skills like job interview, public speaking, uh, you know, career development kind of stuff, as well as how to manage teams and how to, you know, productively uh, problem solve and that kind of stuff. Um, you know, just general tips on on how to better manage your, you know, your life, basically. But we learn it from an agricultural perspective. So we learn about team management and, you know, job interviews and, and, you know, uh, like uh, business skills based off of agricultural careers. Or we learn about, you know, even even practical things like, you know, science and math and history and that kind of stuff. We learn it in an agricultural setting. Um, We learn how to manage our time, resources and, and finances in an agricultural setting. So the idea behind FFA was not just for agricultural education, but it was for, developing young you know young adults and young you know teenagers into uh, productive members of society that also had a practical application for those skills and so that's where the agriculture comes in because what's more practical than your food and agriculture is one of if not the largest um, economies in the entire world and so it was you know it just made sense to learn leadership skills and and you know business skills and other skills of, of that sort with a with a grounding in agriculture and in you know a practical setting and so that's kind of the idea behind FFA. Um, there, there are different events that they do. They have uh, a state conference. They have national conferences. They have you know leadership development events that allow kids to practice. Like like I mentioned, some of those leadership skills, like like speaking and, and interviewing that kind of stuff. Um, there's judging teams where you learn about uh, the actual commodities that we that we have in agriculture. Like I was on the uh, citrus judging team, so. My team and I went to state for citrus judging, and we learned how to judge different types of citrus, oranges, lemons, grapefruit, all that kind of stuff. And we didn't just look at fruit all day. We actually had to analyze and compare fruit, and then we had to give a set of reasons to a judge as to why some fruit is better than the other and what consumers might pick versus what's actually good. And you know, so it, it really focused, you know, it focused on um, not just – agriculture and, and, and leadership development, but also, you know, helping us to think on our feet and problem solving and networking and, you know, socializing and that kind of stuff and just really helped us get ready for what was next after high school was kind of the, the central idea behind it. Gosh, yeah, I, I'm i glad I was careful with my acronym there because I was pretty sure it was Future Farmers <laughs> of America. And I was like, I don't want to be wrong. <laughs> so I'm glad that you <laughs> confirmed uh, my knowledge there. Um, yeah, there, gosh, there is so much in there that I am going to restrain myself understanding <laughs> that like citrus judging is probably an entire podcast episode in mm-hmm. itself. So I will I will hold myself back on that. Um, but I I think that's great because 
I think at least for me, and I'm going to, I'm just going to accept <laughs> that I am uh, not a very ag literate person. I'm growing in it, but I, I'm certainly not uh, by trade or tradition. Um, you know, I think for me, like, I'm like, oh, what does a farmer do? They grow crops or they have, or they grow animals, <laughs> or, <laughs> you know? And, and so I, it's easy for me to forget that there is like public speaking opportunities for farmers mm -hmm. or there is the entire business side to consider. Like it's not mm -hmm. just going out there and watering or tilling or not tilling, depending on which camp you fall in. Um, you know, there, there's just so much more involved. So I think that is great. Um, just the, the mission of your ag literacy podcast um, and also all the work that you've done in FFA and forward. Um but I, I have another question for you <laughs> related to this. Um, so in, in your journey, have you found that what has kept you an egg has been um, as a result of finding a problem that you wanted to solve? Like you said, you know, the, the problem of, of people not being egg literate or, mm. or was it more to do with like finding things in ag that were already related to passions that you already had like technology and you just were like oh i didn't know that was an egg but once i found out that it was <laughs> then that barrier was like taken away you know it's that's a really good question um it, it's both are kind of true um and what i mean by that is when I got into agriculture, obviously, I didn't have that as my primary focus. I was focused on technology and science and all kinds of other things. And like you mentioned, I learned that agriculture has all of those things as part of it. And that's also a big portion of the podcast is helping people realize that agriculture is more than just farming. It involves science and business and technology and, and law. And there's so many different branches of agriculture that just saying that being involved in agriculture means to be a farmer is just not accurate anymore. Um, that's, that's a big part. Of, of what I try to do is tell people, especially people around my age and, and younger, realize that there's other careers they can go into that don't involve being a farmer. You know, there's tons of jobs out there if they want to be, you know, involved in graphic design or engineering or computer science or, or technology. All of those things are available in agriculture without them having to be a farmer. Um, so that, that was a big part of it was realizing that some of my interests were tied into the thing that I was advocating for in the first place. Um, another big part of it was that, you know, yeah, yes, there was a problem I was trying to solve. Um, I read a statistic during one of my speeches that I was writing uh, from 2011. So it's a bit of an older statistic that said that about 72% of consumers, American consumers, uh, don't realize where their food comes from. They think it comes from a grocery store. Or they don't realize that there's a step, you know, step by step process from farm to fork that gets it to their plate. Um, and so I, I've heard that number repeated a few times. I've heard it's changed now. It's 85 or now it's like it's not quite as consistent with that number is now, but my entire goal since I started the podcast has been to lower that number to try to get it down to, I mean, I'm not sure if I have a necessary goal, but to, to get less than half of the population to be unaware of where their food comes from, to try to help, you know, bridge a, bridge a, you know, a connection between producer and consumer that hasn't been there for a while. So Part of it has been, you know, my interest in, in agriculture and learning more and my interest in engaging with other, you know, with other people who are involved in, 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 in the industry and learning as much as I can, but also to help, you know, I, I've, I've learned quite a bit that people are really interested in agriculture or that there's potential for them to be interested in it, but they just don't have that bridge there. So I'm trying to be that bridge. You know, I'm trying to help them, you know, find things in agriculture that they can latch to, that they can be interested in, that helps them learn more about where their food comes from along the way. Hey science fans, I hope you're enjoying the show. Interested in learning more? Check out Brendan's podcast, Talk Ag to Me, where Brendan and his guests discuss a variety of ag and ag literacy related topics. We'll also be doing an episode on his show soon, so stay tuned. We also wanted to take this chance to give another quick shout out to our sponsors, starting with Gazmet Technologies. Conduct greenhouse gas flux measurements in the field using the GT5000 Terra. Weighing 20.7 pounds, splash proof IP54 rated, internal pump and battery, and vibration resistant, the GT5000 Terra is a robust and portable multi-gas analyzer for field work. Visit www.gazmet.com or email sales at gazmet.com for more information. 
Our second sponsor is Meter Group. Meter specializes in robust soil moisture sensing, innovative weather monitoring, cloud data logging, advanced data visualization software, and more. Their well-published scientific instrumentation is used worldwide in universities, research and testing labs, government agencies, agriculture, and industrial applications. Find world-class webinars about the science behind environmental measurements at metergroup.com slash fieldlabearth. Thank you for being our sponsors. Let's get back to the show. Wow, what a noble cause. <laughs> that's great. Um, yeah, that's something that really uh, excites me about um, just the work that you're doing and your podcast. I listened to a few episodes um, in preparation for our show, and I think you do a really good job um, of using kind of more of those um, like simpler terms or avoiding jargon that would maybe like throw people off. Um, and also just like a really nice casual <laughs> tone that's not too high level. So uh, I like that very much. Um, but something you've been touching on here is um, is ag retention. And so that's something that comes a lot uh, comes up a lot in in the fields that that we're working with as a societies is like, how do we get, um, you know, both adults and and also the younger generation to to find an interest in this as we deal with problems like, you know, climate change or population booms, urbanization, anything like that, um, food chains, food supply mm -hmm. chains um, that are kind of these pressing issues and like helping, you know, like you said, bridge that gap. So as someone who has crossed over, <laughs> who has who has been both... <laughs> kind of swimming in that water um, for a large portion of your life, but then kind of took that next step. Um, what are what are some of the hurdles that you see to crossing that bridge for people, um, both for kids or, or I guess the younger generation doesn't have to be like kids <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or, or adults? Um, like what stands in the way of getting them interested or involved? Hmm. No, that's a really good question. It's something that I've been working on for a little while now. Um, and I think the biggest thing that I've seen, the biggest hurdle has been the language barrier. Uh, like you mentioned, I, I tend to speak in very simple terms and explain things in, you know, very simplistic ways on my podcast. It's not because I'm, you know, an educator or because I don't like talking in, you know, in more complicated jargon. It's just because I've noticed that the more you start to speak in, you know, a, a complicated, like, especially scientific based language, people tend to start tuning out. And it's not necessarily that they're not interested. It's just because if they're not familiar with the terms, they have a harder time paying attention really to what you're trying to tell them. So that's been a really big thing that I've been working on with my podcast. Um, I actually just, uh, I'm about, I'm about, I'm, well, I'm not sure when this episode is going to come out, but by the time this episode comes out, I may be done with my second season of the podcast. I'm actually wrapping it up right now. I'm working on some, some last minute stuff for season three, but a big portion of my second season has been experimenting with different ways to convey the message of agriculture in ways that my consumer based audience and my consumer guests can understand it. And it's not going to go over their heads, not to say that they're not smart enough to get it, but that it's, it's going to be something that they can resonate with and pay attention to. And I think that I've found a couple ways that work. I'm not sure if they're going to work for everybody, but um, I have noticed that one of the biggest issues with communicating that message is the way that we, we present it. I mean, that's, I, I, I think that might be the public speaker in me, but a big part of, you know, getting people to pay attention to what you say is not necessarily who you're talking to, but it's how you're talking to them. You don't want to be condescending. You don't want to talk over their head. You don't want to talk to them as if they're not smart enough to understand what you're saying, but don't talk to them as if they're rocket scientists. You know, that's not to say that they're not, but you don't want to assume too much. So you have to lay a foundation of where their knowledge set is at and where their level of intellect is at and, you know, talk at that level with them, you know, but you know, also keep it respectful. You know, you can, you can invite them to, to learn new terms as long as you define those terms for them and that kind of stuff. So I think that, you know, to answer your question in terms of what one of the biggest hurdles is in communicating that information, and this goes for everything, not just agriculture, it goes for science, it goes for history, it goes for, you know, anything you're trying to teach somebody, you have to speak their language if you want them to pay attention pretty much. Sure. And are there things that you see that that have made people like walk away? And that could be just from your own experience of when you were younger and were like, ah, eh, this isn't for me. Hmm. Um, or like people that were like potential listeners and you were just like, no, like, come back. 
<laughs> um, I'm sure that's never happened to you before. <laughs> um, but like, what, what do you think? I'm just thinking more like, because it seems like there's like a retention problem mm. of like getting people to stay. What in your experience do you feel feeds into that? I think that the the problem with the retention itself is, like I said, it, it could be associated with language. It could also be associated with the level of of I don't want to say level of commitment. That doesn't sound right. It's is basically the way I've the way I've seen it is that people stay interested in things that they have a reason to stay interested in. If you don't give them a reason to care, then they're not going to pay attention as long. So. With, with my podcast, for example, when talking about agriculture, I help people understand that what I'm talking about is not just fun and interesting as long as they can learn about it. It's also something that's very, very relevant to their lives. I mean, food is an essential foundational piece of, of not just human life, but life in general. You know, we, we found societies based off of food and our ability to grow it. We found we founded, you know, our, our ability to, you know, to trade off of food. We, you know, a lot of a lot of our our understanding of how society works is based off of our ability to grow food. The sooner the people understand that, the more they, they tend to perk their ears up a little bit and realize how important it is. So you don't, you don't just have to find something that will get them interested. You have to give them a reason to care about it too. Um, I had an old mentor who uh, unfortunately passed away um, a couple of years ago, but he was one of the ones that taught me how to do a lot of my speeches. He was my public speaking coach and he was, he's was actually one of the biggest, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He he was, he was a big supporter of the podcast. When I first started it, he was actually my first interview and he gave me a lot of ideas on where to go from it. And, and he was a big inspiration for why I continued it as, as long as I did. He used to have a, a big, you know, piece of his, of his speech coaching that was based around having a, a purpose really. So like if I was giving a speech and if I was talking about a topic that I thought was interesting, but I wasn't giving any reason why it was worth listening to, he would completely stop me in my tracks and just say, okay, so what? And so I had to rework my speech and it would, it would stump me every time I would give a speech. I'd be so excited about it. I would get through the speech and he would say, so what? And it would completely crush everything I just built. But it was an important thing to learn. You know, if, if you don't have a, so what factor, then people aren't going to listen. And so that was a big part of, of what adapted my, my new speaking style was building my speeches around having a piece that people could latch to as to why they care. Because not, you know, not to say that people are selfish, but they are, you know, people, people look for things for, you know, for a reason for why they should pay attention to it. If you don't give them a reason, if you don't tell them exactly why this is important to them, they have no reason to, to latch onto that information. But if you say, Hey, you know, your life, your family, the future of your, of your offspring depend on this, they start to perk up a little bit more. They start to realize that what you're saying might be worth listening to, even if they disagree with it, they'll at least take the consideration because they 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 don't want to risk missing something that is, is that important to them if that makes sense no that's that's great um that's really solid advice is just you know it's it is that human connection you know i i've talked about this before um uh if not on this podcast then when i did a guest episode on uh vikram baliga's planthropology podcast uh, check it out, everybody. <laughs> it's good stuff. Um, but we were talking about, you know, when you're communicating with someone, it's not just to like, use a bullhorn and yell at them about like, what is important, like, you have to you do have to find like, why, why it matters to them. Um, mm. You know, even if it's not their passion, even if they don't go into agronomy, you know, it's still helpful to be like, hey, do you like wear clothes? Do you eat food? <laughs> like mm -hmm. agronomy helps with that. It's pretty cool. It's pretty mm -hmm. neat that it exists so that you can do those things. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah. And a big part of it, too, is also, um, like I mentioned earlier, relatability is is huge. I mean, not just giving them a reason to be interested, but something that, that they can directly resonate with. I mean, uh, so like I've mentioned before, you know, in, in episodes I've done in the past, I tend to relate it to things that people like movies, video games, books, that kind of stuff. And it's not just because it simplifies the conversation. That's, that's definitely part of it. But it's something that people can latch to and that they feel is not foreign to them. You know, like I mentioned, speaking in, in language that is, you know, is, is comfortable for them to understand is, is important, but giving them something that is, is not just real, is not just generally 
accepted to be you know important but personally connects to their life is huge and that goes for kids that goes for adults that goes for everything if you can give them a reason to relate you know very closely to what they're listening to then they're going to they're going to connect with it a lot more sure yeah uh when i was listening to your podcast one of the first ones i listened to was the star wars one because <laughs> <laughs> i i like books video games and mm-hmm. movies i like all of those things um So, yeah, that's great. And, I mean, we're kind of already on the topic, um, but I know egg egg literacy is obviously something that you, like, do all the time. Mm -hmm. So what are are some of, like, the key strategies that you have found um, to be beneficial when trying to um, put that message out there or translate things and be that translator? What are some of the best strategies that you've found? Mm -hmm. So like I mentioned earlier, um, ag literacy is is, is somewhat of a a newer concept in terms of of having these kinds of conversations like ag podcasting is not a very popular topic right now. You know, there's there's some there's some new contenders coming to the field that I'm learning about. But, you know, we're we're very, very new to social media. Agriculture is kind of behind the game. And so a lot of it's experimental. So um, some of the stuff that, you know, my my strategies, quote unquote, aren't necessarily you know perfect but i'm still experimenting with them still trying them out and i'm finding some stuff that works and some stuff that doesn't and some stuff that works on some people but not everybody and that's a big you know that's that's an important detail um so one of the strategies that i had had been using quite a bit and it's one i talked about earlier is relating into things that people care about you know movies books video games that kind of stuff um like you mentioned the star wars episode that was a a huge hit you know people love that episode and it, it all ties back to one of my earliest interviews of season two, which was based around ag technology. We were talking about robots and drones and all this kind of stuff that we use in agriculture. And my guests didn't realize that agriculture was that technologically advanced. And some, you know, somewhere along the line, the conversation led to him asking me about which Star Wars droid I thought would make the best farming robot. That single question sparked so many conversations and so many online uh, platforms because I brought that question to them. I said, Hey, look, I had an episode of my podcast where this guy asked me this question. What do you guys think? And it like sparked so many debates and people were interested in, and not just, you know, star Wars debate as usual, but they're interested in looking up information on agricultural technology to see not just what would be practical, but what already exists and how it can be improved. And so seeing that level of commitment to a conversation about a fictional robot was something that I had never expected, but it was really, really cool to see. So that was a big thing, you know, relatability, giving somebody, you know, a reason to latch onto it again, not just for, for personal reasons, but for interest reasons too. You know, you, you can bring it into things. Um, like I, I was on a podcast called geekology, uh, one one. I'm not sure if, you, if you've heard of it, but they talk about all things geek, you know, video games, movies, TV shows, you know, sci-fi, comic books, all that kind of stuff. And we talked about the presence of, of agriculture in the background of a lot of different media. So like WALL-E and Minecraft and, you know, uh, Stardew Valley was one of them. We talked about The Martian, um, breaking down how much my you know, my passion, agriculture surrounded everything that we watch and everything we consume, not just in terms of food, but also in terms of everything that we enjoy as, as entertainment, making that real, you know, making that realization, um, was something that was, that was kind of, you know, a, a big moment for, for the guests or for the, the host of, of the podcast that I was on. He still texted me to this day and said like, Hey, you know, I just watched this movie. And I never noticed it before, but you're right. They have all kinds of, you know, ag based things in this movie that we were talking about in the episode. It's so cool. And so like getting those kinds of responses really shows that some of those strategies are working. So while that strategy may not work for everybody, it does work for the people that I've been talking to. Um, I do have another strategy that I've been, I've been kind of playing with. Um, it's actually proposed by Cal Poly. It's not even my original strategy. I've just been kind of adapting it. Um, it's called Ease, E-A-S-E. And this strategy is more for like a confrontational kind of conversation. It's not so much for, you know, getting somebody interested in a topic. It's more so how to like, Dif- uh, basically diffuse a situation if it gets heated. So if you're talking to somebody or if you come across somebody who's uh, getting really, really heated about a particular topic and you want them to listen to your side of it, you can use the ease strategy to kind of help initiate the conversation without coming off you know, too aggressively or, or getting into the heated part of things. And so basically ease is broken down. The first E um, is, is uh, engage in the conversation. You know, so you, you initialize the, the interaction first of all. Um, the A is then assess the situation. So you figure out what their side is, what, why they're so mad about it, um, you know, kind of what, what caused all of this in the first place. 
the S is is story. So that's your side of it. So you um, you basically after listening to them, you ask them to listen to you, and then you give your side of things. And then the last E is to earn their trust. Doesn't mean you have to change their mind because there are some people who will never have their mind changed. But if you can earn their trust and you can come to a conclusion where you both agree on. Basically, you, you, you may even agree to disagree, but if you can come to the conclusion of having the conversation, even if nobody you know budges on, on their point of it, but you learn from each other, then that, that's considered a productive conversation, and you can leave it at that. So those are a few of the strategies that I've been trying. Um, I'm still developing some more. I'm still kind of testing some stuff, but um, from the people that I've talked to that have been doing what I've, what I've been doing, those strategies seem to work for them too. So I hope those kind of give a good idea and, and are mostly applicable to other topics, not just agriculture. Yeah, those are some great tips. Um, super, super helpful. And I definitely now want to go listen to that Geekology 101 episode. So we'll include a note, <laughs> uh, a, a link to that in the show notes. Um, so uh, another strategy one could potentially do would be listening to a podcast about <laughs> ag literacy. <laughs> so speaking of, it's so convenient. <laughs> uh that, that that was my next topic so um i did want to take segment. some some time here thank you <laughs> <laughs> didn't even practice just came out of the blue um so uh i did want to take some time uh as we're starting to get near the end of this episode um to talk about your podcast we've talked mm -hmm. a little bit about kind of how it started um and, and the, the dream and goal behind it a little bit, but please feel free to share more on that, as well as um, something that I really like about your format, um, not only in that it was fortuitous <laughs> when you asked me if I wanted to be on your show, but also just because I think it's, it's a cool way to do it, is the format of your show, uh, which involves talking to a lot of amateurs such as myself. <laughs> um, and also just like a general, I, I would love for you to give a general plug for your show and tell us more about it. So any, any of those things. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So um, as, as mentioned, my, my podcast is called Talk Ag to Me. Um, it's a podcast dedicated to ag literacy. And to kind of give you know some more background to the show, I did start it my senior year of high school back in uh, April 2018. Um, so I've been doing it for almost three years now. And it's gone through quite a bit of changes. I mean, it's, it's, it's been quite a roller coaster. Uh, I did it for a while before I decided to even start you know doing anything Effect, effective with it. And what, what I mean by that is when I started the podcast, it was just as a way of me to basically vent out information. Like I wasn't even doing interviews for the first few weeks. I was just kind of talking. And I actually had two co-hosts when I started out. I started out with two friends of mine, um, Abby Prince and Evan Garcia. They were both really, really good friends of mine that were interested in my project. And we were all three doing public speaking teams. We were, both, we were all three chapter officers together. We were all, you know, learning about stuff in classes. We were both, you know, we, all three of us were very um, vocal advocates for agriculture in our community. And we kind of just started as a fun way to just, you know, talk about stuff and, and just kind of, um, you know, sit around and, 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 you know, like I said, vent really about all the information that we were stuffing our brains with. And it was kind of just a fun way for us to, you know, get, get together after school and, and just, you know, relax and, and just talk about, ag, you know, talk about ag, you know, like it's, that's, that's why it's called talk ag to me. You know, the entire idea behind it was, um, my co-host named it. He thought it'd be kind of a fun, you know, a fun name for us to just kind of sit around and talk about ag issues and what, you know, what would be, good ways to solve them or what would be, you know, potential ways that we could, we could go about fixing them. And then over time, as my, my teachers started to get involved and, af and after my, you know, my community started to get word about it, it started to slowly evolve into me interviewing other uh, farmers, community members, people in the, in the industry around me. And then it, it just kind of went up and up from there. But I did it for about two years before I started to reach outside my community. I hadn't interviewed anybody that wasn't a farmer or a teacher or somebody that I, I knew from my hometown in that entirety of, of two years just because I couldn't really get a hold of anybody. Um, it was to a point where I was wanting to reach out to people that were not in the ag industry because I thought that that might be a better approach than talking to a bunch of farmers and then hoping that somebody who's not from ag would find it because that obviously wasn't working. But I didn't know how to do that. And so I actually almost quit the podcast. I, I took about a three month hiatus from it. And then right around the time where, you know, quarantine hit and like, right, it was last March, the, the first, you know, the first wave of everything hit. Um, I, you know, obviously had a lot more time on my hands because we were all locked down. And so I said, you know what, I have some new ideas for the podcast, but I want to start off fresh. I want to have a, you know, a, a new, 
a new start to things. And so that's when I started the second season. And the second season, like I mentioned, was all dedicated to interviewing people who were not from agriculture and learning their perspectives. And the reason I picked that format, and and this uh, this actually ties back to the reason I started the podcast um, from the interview format in the first place, was that I wanted it to be a, a pure project of transparency. Uh, I notice a lot that, you know, far, especially farmers from my area, we're scared to talk to media people. So, you know, they're scared to talk to journalists or to news reporters or anything like that because they're worried that their story was going to be shifted and, and twisted and changed and do and all these terrible things that were going were gonna to happen to it. So I created my podcast as a transparent news source, basically. I wanted to be a voice for agriculture that could be trusted because I wasn't going to manipulate anything. And that's why I have a no cut policy on my episodes. All of my episodes are completely raw. I just edit the sound to make it sound better, but I don't cut a single thing out of them because I, I believe that in order to be a, a healthy and happy, you know, communicator between the two entities, I need to have as much transparency as possible. And I make sure my guests know that before they go on the episodes. Um, but that was a that was a, a big thing for for why I wanted to bring on you know quote unquote amateur guests is because by bringing on people who aren't professionals it, it gives my my podcast a, a sense of of almost trustworthiness to say it, it, it's kind of a weird thing to say but you know people who are are listening to non professionals just have a certain level of comfort to them you know if if you listen to somebody who's you know who doesn't know necessarily everything about what they're talking about they just like to kind of talk about stuff and you know they they get their perspectives on things it it gives a certain level of comfortability because you're not listening to somebody who you know could potentially be be paid to say something that they, they don't actually believe or you know you never know these days like there there's there's tons of of you know consumer fear based around listening to professionals that getting people who were not professionals was it was a big thing for me and i've noticed that it's been very successful you know people enjoy listening to my my amateur guests because they bring genuine reactions to things and you know they they genuinely don't know much about agriculture and that makes it really really fun to hear their you know to hear their thoughts on things because they're not super strict and formal about it they can laugh they can make jokes they can you know just just mess around and ask you know silly questions sometimes and it makes for good content and it you know arguably it's not about making the good content it's about making sure that that message gets out to as many people as possible but if that helps that happen then i'm, I'm all for it and so that was kind of the foundation as to why i went with the the more amateur style of, of interviewing is just because I think it's more fun that way. I'm not opposed to having, you know, professional people on my podcast. It's just not really what I go for. Um, it tends to be more interesting, I think, to bring on people who have genuine reactions and, and have, you know, outside opinions on things that are not from the professional sphere that think they have to be all strict and, and you know, and, and formal and all that kind of stuff for the entire episode. How fun. Um <laughs> <laughs> it's like that's really smart um but yeah i like that because it's kind of like you know when you can go into something and be like i don't know a lot of what i'm talking about here <laughs> it frees you up to like learn with people mm -hmm. and i think that is um really really fun um and and really shines through on your show um so we will obviously have links to that in in our uh, show notes, and I will also be a future amateur <laughs> on, <laughs> on your show, uh, just uh, so people can find that as well. Um, so this has been a great interview so far, but I do have uh, three questions left for you. Okay. So the first is, if you will want to learn more about these topics, um, where can they go? Well, uh, to learn more about the topics that I personally talk about, I have a whole archive. My whole first season is answering questions about different ag issues. Um, so you can go anywhere, you know, to, to listen to my podcast on that kind of stuff. Um, if you want more specific information on the issues, I know that the Farm Bureau has some great information on, on a lot of different ag issues. The USDA has some great articles on some stuff. Um, you know, Ag in the Classroom and National... Um, uh, oh, what's the word? I can't remember what it's called now. Um, anyways, there, there's, if you just look up, you know, any kind of ag issue, it could be urban sprawl, it could be, you know, um, GMOs, it could be pesticide use, like all that kind of stuff. If you look it up, the first three or four articles are going to be, um, you know, very high ranking ag based organizations that have some good information on there. But if you want kind of like the layman's conversation about it, I guarantee I have an episode on it. So just go anywhere on my podcast and, and look it up and you'll be able to, to find it then you know, get my, get my take on it. Great. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll include some show notes there as well. Uh, links, uh, second question 
is mm -hmm. if people want to get involved, be that in egg in general or egg literature, what can they do? I think that in terms of the ag literacy part of things, my my call to action for every episode is just to make yourself more aware of what's going on. So do your homework, you know, look things up, learn about the issues. And to be involved in agriculture doesn't necessarily mean to be a farmer. Um, it's, it's very difficult to be a farmer nowadays. My advice to anyone who wants to get involved in agriculture is look in your local communities, you know, find the agricultural sector of your community because they are in every community even if you have to go outside the city a little ways to find them they're there um just go and talk to you know some of the farmers around the area ask what you know what you can do some if if, if you're looking to actively work in agriculture if you go up to a dairyman and say hey you know if, if you if you pay me you know 13 14 bucks an hour i'll do whatever you want then they will they will find something for you to do. You'll either be milking cows, you'll be cleaning stalls, something if, if you're looking for that kind of experience. Um, but there's, you know, there's tons of opportunities out there. You can go and learn from, you know, different, like you can learn about irrigation technology. You can go work in labs with computer science. You can go uh, visit processing facilities. I know they do tours and they'll show you like the exact process that your food goes through to get to your plate. Um, you know, all that kind of stuff is pretty much readily available wherever. If you want to find out more about that, I know that, you know, there's probably some organizations that have websites for that kind of stuff. Um, I could list off a, you know, a million and one companies that have offers for that kind of stuff, but really just go and go and look for stuff. You know, don't, don't be afraid to go up to a farmer and ask them some questions as long as you're respectful about it. You know, if you, if you come off too aggressive, obviously the farmers could be a little bit more closed off, but that's with anybody, you know, if you come across aggressive, they're not going to want to talk to you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, really, what what I always advocate for is not for people to get actively involved in agriculture in the sense of they have to work in, in the field. I always advocate for people to just be aware of agriculture and to support it in the sense of don't make the farmer's job any harder. It's already hard with regulations and with the economy and with you know a million other factors leaning against them. Just make educated purchasing decisions, make educated voting decisions, and don't be afraid to ask questions if, you, if you're really not sure about something. And don't believe the first thing you read on Facebook because, you know, everything you read on Facebook is definitely approved by uh, professionals. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to say it's not, but you know, you should, you should just, just double check and just be safe. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, great advice. Um, yeah. And then final question for you is what is one fun fact that people wouldn't know about you if all they had was this podcast or I will extend that to your podcast? Oh, man. That's a, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, people know a lot of weird stuff about me because of my podcast. Um, huh. You know, my you don't have to be fun... super strict about your <laughs> podcast. <laughs> My my go to fun fact is kind of the fact that I do the podcast. Um, I think that you know my my history as a as a sci fi nerd is probably one of the things that people don't don't know much about. Um, besides you know obviously the Star Wars stuff. Um, and if if they're going off of just this podcast though, they may not know about my avid love for cows. Um, I absolutely adore cows. Uh, I know way too much about them and you know i i um you know if if you ask me any question about cows i more than likely could be able to answer it and when i was in high school i actually learned i actually earned two titles uh one was barn captain and the other one was cow whisperer because i was very good at working with cattle and i was able to kind of learn enough about their behavior to almost predict what they're going to do and, and what kind of what they were thinking so people start calling me cow whisperer because i was the only one that could actually work with them without getting hurt Wow. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, Citrus Judge, podcaster, and Cow Whisperer, a That's man right. of many talents. Thank <laughs> you so much for being on the show today. This has been a great interview. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It was, it was sure a pleasure. Thank you for listening to Field Lab Earth. You'll find links to today's resources in our show notes or on our website. If you have any questions, comments, or recommendations for show topics, please contact us at podcast at sciencesocieties.org or on Twitter at Field Lab Earth. If you'd like to hear more content like this, please subscribe, and don't forget to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Stitcher, or anywhere else you find your podcasts if you like our show. We're also available on Lyceum, the world's first audio learning community, where you can join our discussion group and comment on each episode. 
This podcast is a joint production of the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, and Soil Science Society of America. Special thanks to Lobo Loco for the use of their song Spook Castle on the intro and outro of our show. Opinions and conclusions expressed by guests are their own and are not considered as those of the American Society of Agronomy, Crop Science Society of America, Soil Science Society of America, its staff, its members, or its advertisers.